Welcome to the 10th Annual Sexual and Reproductive Health Webinar. My name is Craig Tower. I'm the Senior Program Manager of the Johns Hopkins Office of the Mid-Atlantic Regional Public Health Training Center, or MARPHTC. Uh, that is of the Johns Hopkins Office of the MARPHTC. MARPHTC is a partnership among schools of public health, academic institutions, and public health agencies and organizations. It works to strengthen the capabilities of the public health workforce to support the delivery of high quality public health services throughout the Mid-Atlantic region. The topic of this year's presentation is congenital syphilis, a preventable tragedy, what clinicians need to know about prevention and management. Uh, before we begin our presentations, I'd like to invite our online participants to visit our website to view our available online and face-to-face -face offerings. And for those of you watching online, we invite you to write your questions in the chat bar to the right of the presentation for the presenters at any time, or you can also email us at the, um, webs at the um, email address, excuse me, that you're seeing online, maphtc at jhu.edu. We'll answer the questions at the end of the presentation. Let me now turn the, microwave, the microphone over to Elizabeth Lebo, Policy and Program Associate with the Center for Sexually Transmitted Infection Prevention at the Maryland Department of Health. Thank you, Craig, and good afternoon. On behalf of the Center for STI Prevention at the Maryland Department of Health, and along with our training partners, the STD HIV Prevention Training Center at Johns Hopkins and the Mid-Atlantic Regional Public Health Training Center and the STD HIV Prevention Training Center and our state medical society, MedCHI, I'd like to welcome you to our 10th annual webinar. Today's presenters are Dr. Jean Sheffield and Dr. W. Christopher Golden. Dr. Sheffield will be presenting first she joined the Johns Hopkins faculty in 2015 as the director of the Maternal Fetal Medicine Division and as a professor in the Johns Hopkins Medicine Department of Gynecology and Obstetrics. Dr. Sheffield re received her undergraduate degree from the University of Notre Dame and earned her medical degree from the University of Alabama at Birmingham. She completed her residency in obstetrics and gynecology there and a maternal fetal medicine fellowship at the University of Texas Southwestern Medical Center in Dallas, Texas. She's board certified in obstetrics and gynecology and in maternal fetal medicine. Her areas of clinical and research expertise include medical and surgical complications of pregnancy with a focus on infectious diseases in pregnancy. Dr. Sheffield currently is working with the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention on the upcoming STD treatment guidelines, and she's also working with us at the Maryland Department of Health and our other training partners on a variety of syphilis-related prevention and management activities. Dr. Christopher Golden is an assistant professor of pediatrics at the Johns Hopkins University School of Medicine, and he's the medical director of the newborn nursery. He received his undergraduate degree in zoology from Duke University, his medical degree from the Johns Hopkins School of Medicine, and subsequently completed his residency in pediatrics and a fellowship in neonatal perinatal medicine at the Johns Hopkins Hospital. Dr. Golden's areas of clinical expertise are neonatology and perinatology, and his research interests related to today's webinar include congenital and neonatal infections, specifically syphilis, herpes simplex virus, HIV, and Zika virus infection in newborns. Nationally, Dr. Golden is on the editorial board of Contemporary Pediatrics. He's also a member of the Council on Medical Student Education and Pediatrics. At Johns Hopkins, he is a neonatal consultant to the Johns Hopkins Hospital Biocontainment bio Unit. Please help me in welcoming Dr. Sheffield and Dr. Golden. Thank you. Thank you, and it's a pleasure to be here today. Uh, Dr. Golden and I are going to be splitting this talk. I'm gonna start off with the epidemiology and the maternal side, and then Dr. Golden will be stepping in and addressing the congenital syphilis side um, that way. So I'm going to get my slides set up here. There we go. Uh, Dr. Golden and I, neither of us have any disclosures. So starting off with maternal syphilis, 
Uh, I've got a number of slides, but we'll go through relatively quickly. I'll, I have about half the time with y'all. So first thing to talk about, obviously, is just epidemiology. So when you start going through the epidemiology of congenital syphilis, you have to look at all sexually transmitted diseases. So you'll notice the 2017 numbers uh, from the CDC are up there on the upper left-hand side. And you'll see that while syphilis is not as common as, say, gonorrhea or chlamydia, there were over 30,000 cases uh, in 2017. It looks like the preliminary numbers for 2018 are going to end up being a little bit higher. And on the bottom right-hand side, you'll see that this uh, increase in syphilis cases that we have seen has resulted in a subsequent increase in the congenital syphilis cases to 918 cases in 200, 2017. And again, preliminary numbers are not, not, not looking good for 2018. So this is primary and secondary syphilis rates and congenital syphilis rates um, in, the, in the nation. You can see the significant rise. The left-hand bars are 2014 right-hand bars are 2017. And you can see just primary and secondary syphilis rates uh, are increased about 53%. And on the far right-hand side, you can see congenital syphilis rates, and that's a 99% increase since uh, just 2014. When you start looking at some of the CDC numbers, uh, these are the most recent confirmed numbers through 2017. Besides that little bit of a bump from 86 to about 91 or 92 that a lot of us that have been doing syphilis research for a while remember fondly because a lot of the research came out of that time period, the uh, public health and epidemiologists do not remember this time frame fondly. That was a very difficult time in the United States with such a huge rise. And unfortunately, you'll notice the rise near the very end in the last four year, or last several years, we're starting to see it again. And this bottom right-hand uh, bottom right hand graph that's just from 2008 to 2017, and you can see there's a significant rise across all the different parts of the country, not just certain areas. Uh, depending on where you're, uh, where you're observing this webinar, look for your state. Uh, I'm in Maryland, so of course I'm going to always look for Maryland first, and then I came from Texas. And unfortunately, those are two blue states. They're not dark blue, but they are certainly very blue. So look for your state. You can see what the rates are. There is a whole lot of blue, however, you'll notice on this map, which is incredibly concerning for 2017. These are congenital syphilis rates. So even though Maryland, again, where I'm speaking from, we were not quite the darkest blue, unfortunately in congenital syphilis rates, we are the darkest blue. So a number of these states here, that really dark blue um, are, are areas of concern for congenital syphilis or most concern. So this is what congenital syphilis has done from 2012 to 2017. Unfortunately, we've seen 178% rise uh, in congenital syphilis rates. And those bars there, are those bars are the C-section, or congenital C-section, congenital syphilis rates. And the orange uh, line is the primary and secondary syphilis rates in reproductive age females. So it kind of mirrors it as you would expect. So this is some information from the United States. People always wonder, okay, say you've got 918 cases of congenital syphilis. Where are these cases actually coming from? So the CDC has kind of narrowed down some of the data on where these cases are actually coming from. So this is in 2017 of the 918 cases. These are different missed opportunities, things that we might be able to address both from the clinical side, but also from the public health side, from the education side. This is where we need to tackle. So you'll notice the top line is just no prenatal care. Let me just uh, mouse it for you. Um, so this top line here is no prenatal care. That was 34%. So a third of them didn't come so we could get the opportunity to screen and treat these pregnant women, unfortunately. But that still leaves 64% of the patients that did have some prenatal care. So 7% had prenatal care but never got tested. Um, some of them got prenatal care, but were not tested in time to prevent congenital syphilis. Remember the definition of congenital syphilis requires at least four weeks from the time of diagnosis and treatment until the time of delivery. So that was 28%. So not only do we have to get these patients into prenatal care, but we have to make sure we screen and treat them well before delivery, if at all possible. And then interestingly, we do have several that had were negative at their first test, but they seroconverted during pregnancy. And that was 14% of cases or 126, stressing the incredible importance in screening in the third trimester and in high prevalence areas also at the time of delivery. 
And then there were about 15% we just didn't know. But that is, that's a nice way of looking at the data to try to figure out where we as clinicians and we as public health servants uh, can focus our efforts to try to get these patients in screened and treated. So these are um, still uh, syphilitic stillbirths and congenital syphilis infant deaths in the US. These have also quadrupled since 2012. The yellow line are stillbirths or infant deaths um, and the blue bars are the uh, congenital syphilis cases. So you can see, as you would expect, stillbirth or infant death associated with syphilis is also on the rise. So again, I'm, I'm talking from Maryland, so I want to put the Maryland numbers up here, and I have to thank, thank you all for uh, all the information that we get received from Maryland. These are um, update numbers through April 8th, 2019. So these guys were definitely on top of it, getting us the most recent data out there. And while this is preliminary data, it's actually quite, it's actually quite accurate. So in Maryland, Primary and secondary syphilis rates from 14 to 18 increased about 60%, very similar to what we saw nationally. And you can see the primary and secondary female reproductive age rates, same thing. Congenital syphilis rates in Maryland in that same time frame increased 81%. And this is the Maryland data, just put another way. The black line is the primary and secondary rates in reproductive age females, and the bars are congenital syphilis rates. So you can see we had a pretty impressive rise earlier on from 2009 to 2011. And actually, Dr. Golden will be talking about some of that time period and some of the data from Maryland that came out during that time period. Then it dropped quite nicely. And unfortunately, we're now seeing numbers again significantly on the rise. So enough epidemiology. Y'all know there is a significant issue. So let me talk a little bit about just what syphilis is in a pregnant woman, how to identify it how to test for it, one or two slides on how to treat it, not much has changed there. And then Dr. Golden will come in and talk a fair amount about congenital syphilis then. So syphilis, this is a disease with only two stages. There is primary syphilis, I'm sorry, there is early syphilis and there is late syphilis divided by a time course, which is 12 months. So if you are diagnosed or if you obtain it, are diagnosed and treat it within 12 months, your early stage disease. If you go over 12 months, your late stage disease. And the reason that's important is you treat them differently. So under early stage disease, that less than 12 month time period, there are three stages. There are three stages. There is primary syphilis, secondary syphilis, and early latent syphilis. And then if you go beyond the 12 months, then you're dealing with the late stage disease, which is late latent syphilis, and we kind of lump unknown duration under that time period also because we treat them the same way. So primary syphilis, this is just wherever the bacteria enters the body. It could be you know, on the baby's head, it could be on a vulva, it could be on a penile shaft. Wherever the bacteria enters, the human body mounts an immune response. They develop a chancre, which is really is just a flat base raised red firm border, unless it's superficially infected, it actually doesn't hurt that bad, not usually a problem. You get a little bit of non-separative lymphadenopathy, and then if you don't do anything, the human body's pretty good about fighting it off, the chancre eventually goes away. The problem is, oftentimes the bacteria doesn't. So even though the chancre may be resolving, that bacteria, which was localized initially, now goes systemic. And once the bacteria goes systemic, then you're left with multiple different symptomatology. And this is where you know that, that syphilis is the great imitator comes in because it can affect multiple different systems. So one of the systems it can affect is the dermatologic system. So about 90% of secondary syphilis patients end up with lesions. They end up with a whole body rash. They end up lesions on their palms and their soles, which I'll show you a picture of in a minute. They may get patchy alopecia. They may get mucosal or mucus patches. So this is kind of what secondary syphilis looks like in some of our patients. This is a patient with a whole body rash. That's kind of the textbook syphilis rash. You may see palm and sole lesions like this one. You may see these nice mucosal patches. Um, there's a uh, kind of a mucosal patch on the tongue there. So those are kind of standard dermatologic abnormalities. There are also evidence of secondary syphilis. There are other evidence of secondary syphilis, the genital tract. Oftentimes you'll end up seeing these multiple moist lesions called condylomalata. So not condyloma of HPV, but condylomalata 
of secondary syphilis. And you can see just these multiple moist patches. Occasionally what you'll see are lesions like this where the condylomalata is starting to pop up right as the chancre is starting to resolve. Other things you may get, this is a bacteria, this is a systemic bacterial infection. So you may also get the standard non-specific generalizable symptoms, you know, low grade fever, malaise, they just don't feel good. They also, as you can see, about 40% of them, if you lumbar puncture every patient that has secondary syphilis, you're going to find a fair amount of these that have CSF abnormalities. However, the vast majority of them do not exhibit CNS abnormalities such as uh, meningitis. Okay, if you go where, if you don't do anything, those lesions usually resolve. If you're still within that 12 month time period of acquisition to treatment, if you're still within that 12 month time period and you have no lesions anymore, you are now early latent stage disease. They are asymptomatic. The important thing to know is they still can relapse occasionally. They still can develop some symptoms, but other really important thing is they are still infectious. They can still transmit to a partner. They can still transmit to a baby. It's not as high as secondary syphilis, but they can still transmit. Then if you go beyond that 12 month time period, that's late. That's when you get to the late stages or late latent syphilis. So that's if they're asymptomatic, they've gone over 12 months, you don't find anything, you, you pick it up on just a laboratory test and they either don't know when they got it or they say, oh yeah, I got it two years ago from this partner and just never got treated. So that's your late latent syphilis. Tertiary syphilis, a lot of the people that are listening to this webinar probably have never seen a tertiary syphilis case. Um, the, you know, most of the tertiary syphilis cases I saw was back 20, 30 years ago when I was first starting out. We would occasionally see a patient with benign gummas, or we may see them on the cardiovascular service where you end up with cardiovascular syphilis. The other thing we would often do is when a, an older patient was admitted to a psychiatric facility, an RPR was one of the things we used to standardly check because you could see, uh, you could see um, tertiary syphilis in the neurosyphilis realm. I put this slide in here not to, uh, not to dwell on it because it's kind of hard to read, but really the important thing I wanted to mention is syphilis besides infecting the mother will also infect the placenta and you can find placental changes. This is a patient we, a paper we did back now 17 years ago, time flies, but we found very distinct abnormalities in the placenta and the umbilical cord in patients that had syphilis. And the differences were impressive if they had a live born or stillborn infant with congenital syphilis. So I'm only gonna have one or two slides on this only because again, Dr. Golden's gonna spend most of his time talking about this, but congenital syphilis, T. pallidum, we know that this bacteria is transmitted across the placenta from the pregnant woman to her baby. It can occur at any stage of um, any stage uh, of pregnancy. So most of the abnormal or abnormalities we see in the kids occur in moms that have transmitted after 20 weeks of gestation because the baby can mount a little bit more of an immune response. But we do occasionally see it um, in a stillbirth specimen or in a uh, miscarriage. So clinical features. Pregnancy itself really has very little effect on syphilis. Unfortunately, syphilis has significant effects on the pregnancy. Um, increases in abortion and stillbirth, as I mentioned, may increase the risk of preterm delivery, particularly if they've got secondary syphilis, um, and of course, congenital infection that Dr. Golden will spend some time on. This is some data that came out of um, Parkland back in, back in that time frame where I said there was a big bump in the, that 86 to 92-ish time frame. This is a lot of data that came out of Parkland um, during that time frame, what this is is if a mother showed up in labor and had syphilis, one they determined what stage or substage of syphilis they had, and two they then evaluated the baby. And what they found was that if a mom showed up with primary syphilis, so we had 26 women show up in labor with primary syphilis, 23% of the babies either were live born or stillborn with documented syphilis. Secondary syphilis, 60% of the babies uh, ended up having evidence of syphilis, whether it be live-born abnormalities or a stillborn consistent with syphilis. But you'll notice even in the early latents, those that don't have symptoms anymore in the mothers, if they were early latent, 36% of them had an affected kid. And even in the late latents and the unknown durations, you did see some transmission. But you can see the highest transmissions are in that secondary syphilis and early latent. And the important thing to remember is 
The only way to prevent congenital syphilis is to find the infected mothers. So you have to screen them and then treat the infected mothers with enough time for that treatment, not just to treat the mother, but to cross the placenta and treat the child. So what do we do? You screen all pregnant women. There is no risk category that you don't have to screen. All pregnant women should be screened at their first prenatal visit and in high prevalence areas of which Maryland and definitely Baltimore city are, which I'll show you in a minute, all high prevalence areas should also be screened again, either around 28 weeks, um, and, or again at delivery. My opinion, we should screen all three. Um, no infant should ever be discharged from the hospital without confirming a syphilis test in the mother or checking a syphilis test in the baby, which Dr. Golden will talk about. And then any stillborn infant after 20 weeks should be evaluated for congenital syphilis. These are the Maryland screening laws, and these are laws. So screen all women at the first prenatal visit, screen at 28 weeks gestation, and again, screen at delivery in high prevalence areas. And in Baltimore City, um, it is required to um, have screening at the time of delivery because we have such a high prevalence rate. And then again, in Maryland, the guidelines also are to screen all stillborns after 20 weeks. So I wanted to spend a couple of slides on this. This gets very confusing. Um, there are there are only a few ways to test for syphilis. Um, really, it, there's the laboratory side, which is you know do it ra doing rapid infectivity testing and all that. But from the clinical standpoint, the main way we screen for syphilis in contemporary lab testing is we draw a tube of blood, and that serologic test, yeah, that tube of blood, can be sent for two types of serologic test. One, you can test for non-treponema antibodies. These are just antibodies the woman produces in response to something that syphilis increases, um, things like lipoidal antigens. And so that's your RPR, your VDRL, your trust, kind of the standard traditional screening. There are also the treponemal antibodies. These treponemal antibodies are very specific for syphilis. So syphilis antigens, such as some of the treponemal proteins. These treponemal antigens are the TPPA, the MHATP, the FTA ABS. There's also a lot of mass screening um, products that are like CIAs and EIAs that a lot of people are now using. So, and you can see from the slide here, the things increase quite quickly. I'm trying to get my mouse to work here. This is syphilis IgM, which we actually rarely use because it's not, it's kind of fraught with a lot of issues, but you can see very quickly the dotted line and the green line. Green line is the FTA ABS. Dotted line is your VDRL. It very rapidly goes up, THP, or TPHA goes up. So a lot of these go up just within days. The important thing is to look at this axis down here. A lot of them will go up very quickly um, after a syphilis infection. Now this is what's caused a lot of angst around the country because there are two different ways to screen for syphilis. The traditional way, the way a lot of us trained was we took that tube of blood and we did a non-treponemal test. We did an RPR, a VDRL, a trust. We did one of those. The problem is in pregnancy, the false positive rate is not insignificant. It's about one-ish percent, maybe a little bit higher. And you have to track down these patients and their, their contacts and such. So it's a big deal to tell somebody they've got syphilis. So you have to confirm that test. And that confirmation is done with a treponemal antibody, your TPPA or, TA, or FTA, ABS, one of those. So you confirm it. If they're confirmed positive, they have it, you treat them. But a lot of states, or at least a lot of counties and states have gone to reverse sequence testing. This reverse sequence testing is done because the initial part of the reverse sequence algorithm uses a CIA or an EIA that you can do very inexpensive mass screening. So it's cheaper for the laboratory to do, it's easier, you can put a whole bunch of samples on the machine, so it's easy to do, less expensive. The problem is, if it comes back positive, you then have to do a quantitative RPR. If that quantitative RPR comes back negative, still doesn't mean you don't have syphilis, it just means maybe it's early syphilis. So you do your EIA, then you do your negative RPR. If you have a negative RPR, then you have to do a second antibody test. If that second antibody test is positive, then you know they've had syphilis. Now, it may be an old infection. It may be a very new infection, 
but these guys have to be treated. And Dr. Golden's going to spend a little bit of time talking about a study that he's just completed and um, is coming out in publication uh, looking at this in pregnancy. Uh, this will be a very short update because really there isn't much of an update on treatment. Penicillin is still the treatment of choice for pregnant women. There have been other things tried, such as erythromycin and such, but nothing effectively treats both the mom and the baby. So the most important thing is to get that penicillin in. It's one dose if you're early stage disease, but if you want to, conf you want to make sure that baby is treated, get the levels high enough for the baby and treat them, we give a second dose of bicillin. Uh, a week later, Dr. Stafford down in Texas is putting together a multi-center trial, looking at one versus two dose or treatment and looking at long-term outcomes. And hopefully that will be um, funded soon because that's an important study to do. And then um, late stage disease, we give one dose of bicillin every week for three weeks. It is incredibly effective um, across all stages of syphilis. And what constitutes adequate treatment? Missed doses are not acceptable. Absolutely not. So if you have a missed dose, you have to start the course over again in your pregnant women. And what we'd like is that seven day rule. If a woman gets her first dose and she needs three, if a woman gets her first dose and she comes back 11 days later, she has to start the course over again. What we like to see is a fourfold drop in titer. That's an appropriate reduction is that fourfold drop. The problem is this is a patient a paper that Martha Rack put out um, back in 2015 you can see that primary and secondary rates drop pretty quickly, the titers, but unfortunately the unknown duration, the late latents, the early latents, that titer may drop much slower. So oftentimes, even if you do everything right, you treat this patient at 24 weeks gestation and you get the right amount of medication in and her ultrasound looks normal and life is good, that they may still not have a fourfold titer by delivery because it can take months for that titer to drop, depending especially on what stage of syphilis it is. So my final message on my part is just that the battle to um, decrease congenital syphilis has to be waged on multiple fronts. The obstetrician and pediatrician, of course, and you're hearing from us today, but just as importantly, the primary care providers that are out there, the state and local public health departments, um, pretty much anybody that contacts a patient that could develop syphilis, which essentially is any sexually active person, um, needs to be aware of this and needs to fight this battle together. I put this in here, you know, a lot of all states, all states require reporting. This happens to be the form that we use in Maryland for reporting. It goes through stage, symptoms, testing, treatment, no treatment. This is in addition to what the laboratory is supposed to report. So we do have provider reporting um, regulations. And with that, I'm going to pass the microphone now over to Dr. Golden, and then we'll answer questions at the very end. Thank you all. Jean, thank you very much. I always learn a lot about adult manifestations of syphilis when I hear you give uh, your presentation. So I'm going to um, begin now and delve into congenital syphilis. So the end effect of, well, of what we see and what we're expected to manage. This just shows you um, in real time some of the complications, um, including uh, placentopathy, um, chronic phenocytis, uh, bony abnormalities, and hepatomegaly in the child in this initial set of slides. But let's uh, begin the talk. So. Uh, unlike adult syphilis, we really have two sort of brackets in which we consider congenital syphilis, early congenital syphilis and late congenital syphilis. Early congenital syphilis um, is manifest in children under the age of two or with clinical symptoms. These two slides show the early onset. This is the fetal and embryonic um, manifestation of congenital syphilis from a colleague in Spain. Note the large boggy placenta and the maceration of the baby on the left and the significant abdominal distension of the stillbirth on the right, again, going along with hepatitis uh, seen uh, in early onset congenital syphilis. Manifestations of early congenital syphilis do include interuterine growth restriction. There is an inflammatory change that goes along with placental uh, infection with syphilis that limits normal nutritive transfer from the mother to the fetus, limiting overall growth. Hepatomegaly is one of the primary manifestations um, of uh, congenital syphilis. We also look for things such as clinical rashes, uh, uh, hematologic abnormalities, including anemia and thrombocytopenia. And again, this is a list of some other findings that um, we will see throughout. Some of the more common things we see, we see this little baby here um, with, again, hepatomegaly and a, um, and a rash that we call a copper penny rash, diffuse rash. 
This is an autopsy specimen. This is called pneumonia alba, not clinically seen very much anymore, but in children at autopsy who have syphilis, we'll see sort of a whiting out uh, of the uh, normal lung architecture. Okay. We have a child with syphilitic, syphilitic snuffles. Um, this is diffuse um, rhinorrhea, continuous and loaded with treponemes. This is a child with symphil, uh, syphilis um, pemphigus or pemphilitic syphilis, syphilis, which appears to be um, like pemphigus in terms of a rash, but this child had a very elevated titer. This is a child from Canada. And these are some of the bony findings. The second image uh, with the arrowheads is Wimberger sign, that is tibial erosion associated with congenital syphilis. And now we'll talk about late manifestations. These are things that we see in children beyond the age of two. The primary finding we think about is dentition and facial anomalies. So these are examples of four children. The child at the top left has a long nasal bridge, which is called a saddle nose. That's erosion of the normal cartilage associated um, with development and goes along with congenital syphilis. The child in the upper right and the lower left both have palatal um, erosions or um, perforations, which goes along with congenital syphilis. And the CT scan here uh, on the bottom uh, demonstrates, again, a, um, a connection between the hard palate uh, and the oropharyngeal cavity going along with the perforation as well. Other manifestations include interstitial keratitis, and then there's the classic Hutchison's triad, which is um, deafness, interstitial keratitis, and Hutchison's incisors, which actually are demonstrated in this little girl here. I believe I have a better image coming up shortly. Actually, we don't, but what we do have is a little boy who has lost his primary teeth. So this is a young uh, man from Southeast Asia who came to the United States and ultimately lost his central, was absent his primary central incisors as a result of congenital syphilis. I'm going to, again, refresh your memory about the presentation of primary and secondary syphilis in the United States. Again, in 2017, there was a significant increase in the Western United States, though there are multiple states in the, uh, in the uh, lower Midwest and the Southeast that were in the blue or the lighter blue color. These are areas of high incidence. Uh, and then also, if you look at the, uh, the rates um, for congenital syphilis, you'll note again that the Western states, California, Nevada, and Arizona had high numbers. The state of Texas did, as well as Maryland and North Carolina and Florida. Again, not exactly corresponding, but again, reflecting the fact that though the numbers may be a little bit lower here, there's still a significant burden of congenital syphilis, likely reflecting what Dr. Sheffield said is that some mothers are not seeking treatment or receiving appropriate treatment. Again, to refresh you, we have an uptick in the number of uh, congenital syphilis cases, 918 again, um, uh, including 64 syphilitic stillbirths and 13 infant deaths. This increase is roughly 11% greater than 2016, but relative to 2013, it's about 153% increase. And we anticipate the numbers will be higher this year. We're waiting on the official CDC numbers, but again, raises concern about the epidemic of congenital syphilis in, uh, in the United States. In Baltimore, we've had the experience of a congenital syphilis epidemic. In 1996-97, sort of the midpoint of the 90s when I was in training, there was a notable uptick in congenital syphilis roughly five-fold between 1993 and 1996. And a small cohort that was um, noted between early 96 and mid-97, unfortunately, the primary characteristics in Baltimore City were that these women were African-American, single, often unemployed, and had significant problems with drug abuse, and that 80% of these women had some period of contact with governmental services, either social services or uh, through um, incarceration, but were not adequately treated. So again, this remains a big problem. We had the opportunity to treat, but we don't intervene. If we move forward now to 2017, 2018, we can see the numbers here. Again, Dr. Sheffield showed Maryland. I'm going to highlight Baltimore City. What we see here is an overall increase in the number of congenital syphilis cases, a significant uptick from about 10 to 11% from 2017, and relative to 2013, about a 60% increase. Though the absolute number of primary and secondary syphilis cases did take a little bit of a dip, it has dramatically increased. We've had an increase in Baltimore, particularly in the southwestern um, region of Baltimore City, in women who have congenital syphilis, which I think manifests in this uptick here and we have a corresponding uptick in the number of congenital syphilis cases that we've seen. 
As Dr. Sheffield mentioned earlier, there are two ways of managing uh, or evaluating for congenital syphilis, and a lot of this relates to the mother. Unfortunately, cases of congenital syphilis may not often present with the classic findings that I showed you earlier. Is apparently, there are some reports that up to 50% of children who have congenital syphilis will not have clinical manifestations at the time of birth. There are two pathways that you can use, and the American Academy of Pediatrics in its um, publication, The Red Book, actually highlights two potential pathways. There is congenital uh, testing using traditional pathways involving the RPR, the VDRL pathway, and then there is the reverse sequence pathway, which again involves doing a treponemal test. The advantage to the treponemal test done early is that these are new EIA and CIA assays that have the potential to pick up syphilis maybe a week to two earlier than you would with the traditional RPR testing, and the sensitivity and specificity in primary syphilis is much higher than the than reported in traditional RPR testing to begin with. But the Academy actually came out with a series uh, of a pathway which actually involves using, again, CIA, EIA testing to begin with, then going down the pathway of using the RPR. What's important to notice that Dr. Sheffield mentioned is that the use of this pathway requires some intuition and some understanding of the clinical context in which you're working. The treatment of congenital syphilis really hasn't changed as it's not changed for mothers, but we have some very specific rules which we follow among neonates. So a child who has proven or highly proven or highly probable neonatal disease is that baby that has an abnormal physical examination and in the setting of getting an RPR titer on the baby has a non-treponemal titer fourfold greater than the maternal serum titer or has some evidence of a positive dark field assay or positive PCR testing from a lesion or the fluid. That baby should have a major evaluation done, including CSF analysis, a CBC with platelets, transaminases, eye exam, long bone films, an as-needed chest x-ray for respiratory symptoms, CNS imaging, and auditory brainstem um, responses. That baby receives a 10-day course of IV penicillin G, um, given over a protocol, again, over every 12 hours for the first seven days, and then every eight hours for days eight to 10. If a child misses a dose of penicillin, either using the IV regimen or the IM regimen, just as in the adult scenario, the patient has to start over again. The case of a child with possible congenital syphilis is the child who essentially has a titer that does not meet criteria, has a normal physical examination, but there may be some maternal factor that limited adequate treatment. Either the mother was not treated, she had inadequate treatment or an undocumented treatment, she was treated with erythromycin or a non-penicillin regimen, or the treatment course occurred, as uh, Dr. Sheffield mentioned, less than four weeks prior to delivery. In that case, the child should have an evaluation done um, a little less invasive than the first. It is not necessary to provide that if you empirically plan to treat the child with 10 days of parenteral therapy. And again, it's based on the clinical scenario in which you're working. The therapy, again, can be 10 days of IV penicillin or IM procaine penicillin. There is the alternative to use IM benzathine penicillin, but in that scenario, the child has to have complete testing. And when I say complete, there has to be a CSF analysis that is clean and not bloody and must be interpretable. If those tests are normal and the child is um, available for follow-up, meaning that the mother would bring the child back into clinic if there are concerns, you can use the IM benzathine penicillin regimen. If congenital syphilis is less likely, the scenario where the titer is normal, the physical exam is normal, and the mother was appropriately treated, you need to do nothing, abs nothing at all. But experts recommend using one dose of IM benzathine penicillin at the time of presentation and subsequently um, to treat the child and subsequent evaluation of the child's titers for a decrease in the non-treponemal or the RPR, the, uh, the v RPR titer over the span of two to three months with a non-reactive titer by six months of age. The caveat is if that child's titer does not decrease or remain stable six to 12 months after therapy, he should be reevaluated with CSF analysis and receive 10 days of parenteral penicillin G. And in the setting where the child has unlikely syphilis, this is the case that we like to, we hope we see a lot of, where the mother, mother, baby has a normal physical examination, the non-treponemal titer, the RPR titer is less than fourfold the mother's titer, the mother had an adequate treatment during pregnancy, and a serofast titer before, during, and at the time of delivery with the RPR being at one to four or less, for example. That child should be closely monitored 
he may get one dose of benzathine penicillin based on some clinicians feeling that that child could have an elevation in titer and may necessarily need additional therapy and if the baby cannot be followed up. And in neonates where the non-trepanemal tests are, are negative at birth, should be retested at three months of age on the off chance that the mother had a recent syphilitic infection. Again, this all must be taken in the context of the patient population you're serving, where there's situations where there's intravenous drug use, uh, high amounts of syphilis in your community, you must consider that in your evaluation. Now, here comes the controversy. A CIA and EIA test is very valuable, again, in sort of picking up syphilis early. It's felt to be a much more reliable test. However, that positive test in the setting of a mother who has a positive CIA, a negative RPR, and a reactive FTA can mean one of three things. The mother could have had syphilis in the past or in this pregnancy and was appropriately treated with the RPR going to non-reactive. This could be a mother who's had latent syphilis that has never been treated with a natural diminution in the titer that you expect to see, or it could be a situation where the mother has untreated early syphilis. Each of those three scenarios presents a different risk to the child and requires different evaluation based on the algorithm or guidelines that I just showed you. So in our hospital at Hopkins, we went to CIA EIA primary testing of all patients in June of 2011. That left the pediatricians and the neonatologists and the nursery providers in a little bit of a quandary because we were unclear as to what to do when we had women who had this profile. And we had very, a large number of these women that presented with an unclear etiology as to what to do. So we as a group, again, between obstetricians, neonatologists, um, people in adult infectious diseases, in pediatric infectious diseases, as well as people in the diagnostic immunology laboratory at Hopkins, developed an, an in-house algorithm to evaluate these patients. This is the first iteration of this algorithm. This will actually will be published in the Journal of Perinatology uh, within the next three or four months, but this is what we did. In children who, whose mother had a CIA positive RPR negative profile, if the mother had a negative FTA, we sent the CIA EIA on the baby. If the RPR was negative, we felt that that was a false positive and that no testing or therapy was needed. In the scenario where we had a mother who had the CIA positive, RPR negative, FTA positive profile, we sent the CIA um, RPR on the baby and we evaluated, the OBs evaluated the mother and decided to treat her based on clinical indication. There were some instances where the FTA was pending and I'll go into that on the next slide. In that scenario where the, uh, the RPR was negative but the FTA was still pending on the mother, we would have the mother uh, the baby treated with a dose of benzathine penicillin and follow up the mother's FTA and have the patient follow up. If the baby ultimately was, if the mother's FTA was negative, nothing else needed to be done. If on perchance the mother's FTA did come back positive or it, as seen here in this scenario, we went down the following algorithm. We were very, very conservative given the high incidence of syphilis in Baltimore City and we chose to do an extensive workup which actually included an additional feature, an abdominal sonogram, looking for evidence of hepatitis or hepatomegaly as well. If the child had a negative RPR and any of the tests were abnormal, we would empirically treat for 10 days, assuming that this was an early syphilitic infection in mom, the baby had not had a chance to react, and that we would appropriately treat the child. If the baby had normal testing, we would do a one-time dose of uh, benzathine penicillin to treat the infant. This came up with a lot of consternation amongst our colleagues because we were worried about treating multiple patients for long periods of time with penicillin. And in a setting in Baltimore where, yes, we do have high numbers of women with congenital with syphilis, but we also have a lot of women who've had syphilis and have been adequately treated. So we have the caveat here that any baby that had abnormal physical findings would need to have the evaluation done. But in the context of a mother who had normal or serofast testing, no evidence of high-risk activities that included uh, drug abuse or any type of uh, uh, increased sexual commercial sex activity, the baby could be excluded from getting this entire workup done. So we kept that in mind as well. So after putting that algorithm in place, we had two of my now uh, colleagues who were actually residents at Hopkins at the time, Dr. Mei Chen, who's on faculty now in the uh, Division of Neonatology at Hopkins, and Dr. Ibuku Nakanboyo, who is on faculty now at Duke, who actually looked at what our experience was. So they retrospectively evaluated what 
our teams did with regards to both our internal algorithm and the CDC and Red Book algorithms. We looked to see if our teams follow the algorithm, how did it affect management, did we over-treat or under-treat patients, and did we miss any babies with congenital syphilis? So in our evaluation over a four-year period, we had roughly 6,000 pregnant women that had STT testing done during their hospitalizations. We had 71 pregnancies with positive STT results. There were women who we actually um, were working to evaluate, but also had had um, pregnancies prior to actual rollout of our algorithm, so we excluded those. And we actually evaluated a total of 60 women um, during, uh, um, so yeah, 60 women during pregnancy, 25 of them who had positive STTs and positive RPRs. We had um, 16 women who had positive STTs, negative RPRs, and negative FTAs, the presumed uh, false positives. And then these we call the discordant class. These are women who had a positive STT, negative RPR, and a positive FTA. In that same population, we had 6,300 infants. Again, not a one-to-one -one match because we had multiples in there. We had 76 infants with a positive STC result or born to moms with a positive STT result. 12 of the infants that were born prior to the institution of our uh, algorithm overall were excluded. We also excluded one stillborn infant. That left us with 26 babies who uh, were in a situation where the mother was positive STT, positive RPR. 16 where the mother was positive STT, negative RPR, negative FTA, that is the presumed false positive, and we had 21 infants in the discordant class. The important feature is really the discordant class, but I'll walk you through the entire data. From those who had true positives or false positives, again, presumed false positives, clinical management corresponded very well to what the Red Book recommended, as well as what our own internal algorithm said. In the situation where we had false positives, the algorithm recommended no evaluation in a significant portion of those. And subsequently, we note that no evaluation was performed, actually is actually 16. There were uh, uh, no evaluations uh, performed uh, in those women. And of the 16, no evaluation occurred during to mater due to the fact that mothers were given IVIG during pregnancy, which has been demonstrated to produce false positive treponemal assays. The infant had a negative newborn STT. The mother was a low risk mom and the STT was negative, or there were some unclear reasons likely related to the fact that the mother's testing and the baby's testing was negative, but we were not able to completely ferret those out. Of the four infants with well child care up to six months of age in this cohort, none had clinical concerns for syphilis. However, in the infants we were most concerned about, those whose mother's test were um, discordant, where the RPR was negative, but the CIA was positive. That, could, again, could be early onset syphilis. That could be a mother who was treated early in pregnancy and, uh, and had a resultant diminution in titer, or it could be a mother who had an old syphilitic infection prior. No neonatal evaluation was performed in um, 13 of the infants. Two of them were infants who um, were exposed to a mother who had had a previous diagnosis of YAOs, prior to pregnancy and probably had a positive CIA result. We had nine women, um, nine babies whose mothers were treated pre-pregnancy for syphilis. And we had two women who were treated with IVIG therapy and their babies wound up having, um, were, were born and they themselves had discordant titers. We had eight infants in the group that would have not been tested had we done the traditional algorithm of RPR FTA, these babies here they would underwent a complete evaluation or a partial evaluation. Some of these infants did not have abdominal ultrasounds, for example, and, and subsequently were treated. None of these infants had findings on evaluation that were consistent with congenital syphilis. And of the entire 12, 12 of the entire 21 in this discordant cohort, we had clinical data from up to six months after um, birth, and none of them had developed congenital syphilis. Okay, All right, thank you. Dr. Sheffield, if you want to come to the front, we can have time for some questions. Okay. Sure, okay. My first question. If you are planning, this is one of the audience, if you are planning on treating congenital syphilis um, for 10 days, why do you need to do a lumbar puncture? The idea is to establish a baseline at which the patient has in terms of reactivity if the VDRL is positive, and then subsequently the child will need evaluation at one, two, and three months of age, I believe, per the Red Book, to evaluate subsequently for resolution of symptoms. So it really is to establish baseline um, reactivity of the CSF. 
and I also have one question, and I wish I could send whomever sent this in flowers because I love this question. So okay. this is, what treatments are available for those with a history of hypersensitivity to penicillin? We all, we all have to deal with this. Uh, penicillin allergy reporting is incredibly common. Um, I think a lot of hospitals are moving towards testing patients that have a history of penicillin allergy to determine if they have a true allergy. If they have a true hypersensitivity or anaphylactic type reaction to penicillin, they still need penicillin treatment in pregnancy. Nothing else works uh, or works as effectively as penicillin. So what you have to do is there is a beautiful algorithm published by George Wendell back, it's probably now 25 years ago, um, maybe a little bit longer than that, uh, in the New England Journal. And it is a, it is a nice algorithm of bringing a patient into the hospital, putting a crash cart near the bedside that works starting with, um, oral desensitization using penicillin in these patients. And when you can walk through the desensitization algorithm, and once you get through that algorithm, they can get their bicillin and that algorithm desensitization, as long as you can get your doses in every seven days for three doses, uh, that desensitization protocol will cover that time frame. So you can desensitize the patients, but the best thing, if you have it available, is to allergy test them first to see if they truly are allergic to penicillin. Some of the, um, some of the allergists also will do oral challenges in a patient that has a questionable history. And if they don't have the skin testing antigen available, they will also do uh, oral challenges. So there's def several different things you can do. Talk to your allergist at your institution, but there is a desensitization protocol if they have a true anaphylaxis reaction to um, penicillin. And with, and with that, I think that is the last of the questions. Oh, I lied, there's one more. Thank you. Uh, this is a follow-up for Dr. Golden. For the infant, how would we ensure that the infant will not have a hypersensitivity reaction to the penicillin? So it is very uncommon for neonates to have an allergic hypersensitivity reaction uh, uh, to penicillin. Not to say that there are not reactions they can have, but IgE-mediated reactions are extremely rare in neonates. So it would be uncommon for that to happen. For older children and infants, they would have to be done in concert with an ID specialist and an allergist to determine if it's uh, possible. But in a neonate, it is extremely rare for an IgE-mediated anaphylactic reaction to occur. One more. Oh yeah, excuse me. I'm sorry, before we end, I just wanna remind everyone, if you wanna email a question, you can do so to this uh, email address on your screen or enter it into the chat box. Um, if you want to view an archived version of this webinar, we're going to send that out along with um, the brief evaluation that goes out to everyone who registered tomorrow. Thank you, and with that, this concludes our 10th annual Sexual and Reproductive Health Webinar. Thank you to our speakers, Dr. Golden and Dr. Sheffield.